And I should, uh, I should say before we begin that I am a lousy academic and a captivated, a captivated student. I, I've always uh, been a very non-rigorous student. I don't, do, I don't do well in an academic situation, but I'm captivated by ideas, and I've been good throughout my life at identifying mentors and capturing, I hope, the essence of their ideas and then trying to make it real in the activism and organizing work that I'm called to do. And many, many, actually, I would say there are at least uh, four or five of those mentors in this room uh, who have uh, inspired me and formed me and shaped me over the years. Uh, but there's a reason that Jennifer shows up with a speech and I show up with a page full of notes that I make as, as we go. Um, so I think what I want to do is um, just speak specifically about the U.S. context. Um, and I want to say, as Jennifer said, that there's no way in the world any one person can hope to name the U.S. context. Least of all, someone who carries every mark of privilege that we could possibly name at this point in our culture. Right? I've got it all. And I won't rehearse it because you all have rehearsed it yourselves and you know what all those marks of privilege are, but they are very real in my life on a daily basis. It's something I think about all the time. Uh, this summer I published a book uh, that... Uh, was designed to look at the question of what it means for the church to try and reclaim a faithful witness uh, in the time of empire, called Faithful Resistance. And the book is actually co-written with a dozen other people. Each chapter begins with an essay that's written by a practitioner, someone I respect who's doing work in an area that I really think is critically important for us to reflect on. And I'll read a few of those uh, little, just little snippets from some of those essays tonight as we go along. But I think for me, what is entirely clear is that there's no better time to be a follower of Jesus in terms of a faith tradition in the United States than right now. Because the parallels between right now and first century Palestine that Jesus was up against are absolutely clear. Actually, I should say, are becoming clearer all the time. I am grateful, so grateful, that over the last 30 or 40 years, there's been this growing body of academic work that has really begun to uncover just what those parallels are and kind of leave it out there for many of us who are the practitioners to try and figure out just what that leads us to. Where do we go from here? Right? But I want to start where I think Jesus started, and that is with the question of empire. And I just want to name that... Um, the, the fundamental church, the fundamental problem that the church confronts in the United States, in my judgment, is that we made a decision a long time ago. Some would say during the time of Constantine. But certainly in this country, some 300 years ago, that we were going to throw our lot in with the Empire Project. And in the last 80 to 100 years, that Empire Project has become so consuming as to be the entire definition of who we are as a people. And we've managed as Christians in pretty much all the church traditions I can think of across the United States to entirely convolute the meaning of our own scripture in the interest of trying to make ourselves comfortable in the empire project, to make us apologists for empire. So the task, it seems to me, for, for those of us who care about this particular, I guess I should say, my kids don't care. Right? They're 21, 18, and 17 years old, and they don't give a damn whether the church lives or dies. They just don't care. And they care a lot about the world. Um, my, they're politically engaged. They are insisting that we're going to move to Toronto or Montreal <laughs> if and when Trump wins the election. Come right? on. <laughs> There'll be a lot of us refugees, I think, headed your way. Go to the wall. That's what I'm saying. Right? I've mentioned to them that, that, that the chances of a Canadian wall that we have to pay for are a real possibility. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, while I care a lot about trying to help the institution of church become reformed once again, particularly because I come out of a reformed and always being reformed tradition as a Presbyterian, I don't assume that my interest in that project is going to be shared by everybody, or even most people, or especially most people who are most affected by the kind of grinding reality of being on the underside of empire. And, as we uh, 
I, was, I guess it was Crystal I was talking with at dinner. We were talking about how organizing with um, people of faith is often made easier when we pull the stories of the Bible. Things that people would never hear me say, they're more than willing to hear the Bible say. Right? Or at least they're prepared to be opened by the experience of hearing the Bible say. Um, so uh, the, the most fun I've had with any scriptural passage in my work trying to help bring the church to a new spot, to understand its task of moving from the heart of the empire to the margins of empire, has been the passage of what's mostly called in our biblical uh, narrative the story of the talents, but which in my mind should clearly be called the story of the third courageous, radical, in-your-face slave, right? And so most of you in this room have worked this text even in the ways that I'm talking about, but what I want to, I want to just share the kind of upside-down nature of what that text is doing to our church right now or has the potential to do to our church, and talk about how my experience of trying to make it happen across the church. So, you know, I grew up on that text being preached from the pulpit at least once a year as uh, a story about how God wants me to use my talents for the, for the furtherance of the kingdom of God and to be good to my friends and my neighbors and my family. Um, and if I did these things, then I would inherit the kingdom of heaven. It came out something like that, right? It was clearly meant to be, as far as the preachers in that context were concerned, an allegory for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like. And it was a, an entire mystery to me that got opened up, I think first by colleagues in Guatemala, actually, at the uh, Evangelical Center for Pastoral Studies in Guatemala City uh, some 20 years ago. <laughs> who read this text with me and said, Rick, man, you got it so wrong. <laughs> this is not what this text is about. It doesn't say. I had a, a biblical scholar, a, a, a New Testament scholar, who insisted that he should parse the language of the first sentence of that text with me. Because it does not say the kingdom of heaven is like. It says, it is as if a man going on a journey summons his slaves. Right? And so the point of this story becomes... Not that it's a story about the way the world ought to be or the way the kingdom of heaven ought to be, but rather the way the world actually is. Yeah. So you end up with, it. How, does, how does someone own this much land in first century Palestine, right? The only way you can do it is by taking advantage of people who are weaker than you. You loan money out at exorbitant rates of interest. You secure, they secure the, the loans with deeds to their own properties, and then when they can't pay the debt, the land is collected, and you end up with landholders who are the equivalent of today's multinational corporations whose holdings are so vast that they have to be gone for months at a time in order to check on all of their various holdings and put the slaves that they trust the most in charge of their holdings as they travel, which is exactly the way Jesus tells this story. And when the first and the second slaves who are entrusted with five talents, which we know actually is a, a talent was equivalent to about 15 years wage for a common laborer. So we're talking about a lifetime wage when we talk about five talents. It's a big amount of money. When that slave is entrusted with five talents and told to, to care for it and multiply it and manages to double the money, the only way the slave could have done it was, once again, by taking advantage of his weaker neighbor. Right? And the same thing is true with the second slave. And then there's this marvelous passage that continues at some level to both confound and fascinate and challenge me. The third slave approaches this master. Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed, and so I was afraid, and I took your money and hid it in the ground. I buried it. Here you have what is yours. And the response, you knew, did you, the harsh master says, that I was a harsh man. He doesn't even argue with the slave, right? He, he owns it. <laughs> Speaking of Donald Trump, yeah. he owns it, right? And says, yeah, that's exactly who I am. You should have done what everybody else does. Or at the very least, you should have invested it with bankers so that I have the interest upon my return. And what's the answer? Not enter into the joy of your master, which is what we hear for the first two slaves, meaning, come on in. The water feels pretty good. You get to be a part of this project with me and all the rest of us who are winners, right? But instead... You are banished to the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Meaning, welcome back to the underside of the empire. Welcome back to the underside of the global economy. Well, you know, if you've grown up on that passage meaning one thing all your life, and then someone tries to open it up for you, the first reaction is often defensiveness in my experience. And it seems to me that there is no more pivotal passage, though there are many other very meaningful passages that can be worked in the same way. But I don't believe there's a more pivotal passage anywhere in the New Testament 
than this one for the project of trying to get the Christian church to get off of its blessed assurance, as my friend Jacob mm -hmm. Nelson would say, and move to the margins. And the critical importance of moving to the margins is more and more evident all the time. So what does that mean? Well, you know, it means the kind of work that Crystal is doing in Baltimore, organizing folks. But um, it also means that we've got to go to the heart of the project that we appear to have been totally clueless about that the Black Lives Matter movement is lifting up for all of us. What do we do about the fact that we are caught, all of us, in these structures, these systems of white supremacy that have got us so convoluted in our own thinking that we really, we truly cannot see straight? Um, Warren grew up in his earliest years in a church in York, Pennsylvania, about a three and a half hour drive from here, Faith Presbyterian Church, all African American church, that um, shortly after Warren's father left there as the assistant pastor in the early 1960s, decided that it couldn't hold it together any longer, financially primarily, I think. Is that right, Warren? It was primarily a financial question. And so they were invited to merge with First Presbyterian Church of York, Pennsylvania, a church at that time of some 1,600 almost all white members. So you have an all African American church of 200 merging with an all Anglo church of 1,600 in 1965. 1965, three years before my father became the youth minister at First Presbyterian Church of York with this newly constituted merged church. Warren and I knew each other and were good friends for years before we figured out this connection that we had with one another. In 1968, three years after the merger and the year that my father went to this church, uh, the summer of 68 and the month of July, the curfew laws were being unfairly enforced against only African-American young people, and nine young uh, African-American men were arrested, and the town erupted into what were then called riots, but by any measure should have been called protests. And the protests bubbled along for a better part of a year, and then in 1969, the summer of 69, things had gotten so bad that York had brought in armored vehicles, and they were patrolling the streets, police officers were patrolling the streets in armored vehicles. And a police officer named Henry Shaw in his mid-twenties, white, a uh, police officer, was standing, I, I picture him in some kind of a turret, though I don't know for sure how it happened, but he was in an armored vehicle, and someone shot him, and he was, uh, he was hospitalized and died two weeks later. The very next day after his shooting, a young woman named Lily Bell Allen from South Carolina was visiting the city of York, visiting friends and family there, and they were out driving around, and someone took a wrong turn, and they ended up in an all-white neighborhood in downtown York. And a sniper, white young man, shot into the car and killed Lily Bell Allen, the mother of a seven-year-old child. Here's the thing. I was born in 1964. I was four years old when we moved to that church. My father was a minister in that church until I graduated from college in 1985. And I never once heard the story or Lily Bell Allen's name. Not once. In all the time I was growing up. When I asked a little bit about what was going on in the late 60s as I became more conscious and I would ask my dad what was going on here. Um, he would simply say, oh yeah, it was really scary, there were riots and tanks were in the streets. Boom. End of story. Okay. Now, I have to say, my father was not particularly conscious politically or theologically, frankly, in the 1960s. He himself would admit that. And he's come a long, long way today at age 73. He's in a very, very different place than he was then. And he's willing to do some self-examination on this matter. And so when I began wrestling with these questions around um, race and white supremacy and the structures that hold us bound and held us captive, particularly in the context of Michael Brown's death in uh, Ferguson and the wide variety of shootings that have happened since then, I went back to my dad and I said, really? Tell me the story. What really happened? He couldn't tell me. First Presbyterian Church in New York did this bold, amazing thing. They welcomed the African Americans. They were given spots on the session. They were allowed to teach in the Christian education program. They sang in the choir. They were welcome in all ways in the life of the congregation as long as no one tried to change the narrative or the culture. Which is witnessed by the fact that I can find no record of a conversation at a session meeting about what was taking place just six blocks away, affecting some 200 members of the congregation. 
or I can, and I can find no record in the, in the public record of the pastoral staff of that church or any other white church in York showing up at the Crispus Attucks Community Center to stand with the African American pastors while these events were unfolding. So there you go, folks. I am the perfect example of what's wrong with growing up in that kind of a system. And we're going to have to figure out how we're going to respond to that kind of a system if we have any hope, really, of making a difference. So you've got empire, you've got structures, systems of white supremacy that are deeply embedded into our psyche as a people and that, at the end of the day, are life sucking for every single one of us. You've got a whole area that I will not touch on because you have done it so beautifully, but that we share around the questions of climate change and care for creation and our responsibility to the indigenous peoples of our land. And Chief Perry, I am so grateful, not just for your being here tonight, but for our growing relationship I'm mindful that this building and every Presbyterian church in the country is sitting on stolen land. And that we're going to have to figure out how to make amends. And I, I've been, <laughs> you want to watch a room go silent, watch when I'm in a room of national church leaders and I suppose that every church building in Seoul ought to be contributing some significant amount of money towards some kind of reparations project. Doesn't go very far yet, but someday it's going to. And then a fourth area that I just want to lift up and put on the table is uh, something that is articulated more clearly by my friend and colleague and a member of this community, Rabia Terry Harris, with whom you'll be speaking tomorrow better than anybody else I know. The questions around the roots of religious violence in religious exceptionalism and the ways that the church is entirely beholden to religious exceptionalism. So I want to finish with, or just read these two quotes and then I've got one other last quick story to share. One, story, one quote comes from Allison Harrington, uh, the pastor of Southside Presbyterian Church in Tucson, Arizona, that has a long history of doing work with migrants, welcoming them into their community, a church I was a member of for 20 years and that I feel deeply connected to. In a year ago, or a little more than a year ago now, uh, that church welcomed a, a woman named Rosa into sanctuary to protect her from being deported, and she ended up staying 461 days with some kind of direct accompaniment 24 hours a day for the entire time from a member of the congregation. They had nightly prayer vigils. They opened a little room they called a hospitality suite next to her room, and there was somebody there all the time to be with her and to be vigilant and to keep watch. Listen to Allison's reflection on the challenge of empire. In 461 days, we learned a lot. From how to sustain daily prayer vigils to recruiting volunteers to the ins and outs of our terribly complicated